It's now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, Speaker. What a, what a first week. Uh, it's Thursday, the end of the legislative week, and this government still hasn't tabled its promised bill to return lands to the Greenbelt. They talk a big game, but their action on Greenbelt accountability this week boils down to just trust us. Speaker, we could have had this done by now. In fact, this side of the House tried. So to the Premier, what's the holdup? The Minister of Municipal Affairs, Government House Leader. Speaker, as, uh, as I said, uh, of course, I will be uh, uh, tabling a, a bill in the very near future that will uh, not only uh, protect, uh, not only return the lands that had uh, previously been uh, removed from the green belt uh, through regulation. I will be presenting a bill that will, in fact, uh, guarantee the borders of uh, the entire green belt with the addition of the 9,400 acres that we had uh, previously suggested would be put in. So we'll be presenting a bill that will uh, guarantee those borders in legislation, uh, removing the ability of government to uh, change those borders uh, simply through regulation. Mr. Speaker, we'll be presenting that bill to the House very soon. A supplementary question. In the can even further down the road. Uh, in 2018, the Premier was caught on video in a back room promising land speculators that he was going to open up the Green Belt. And then he backed away. He said, oh, they don't want me to touch the Green Belt. We won't touch the Green Belt. Now we know that before the 2022 election, senior staff in the Premier's office were discussing removing lands from the Greenbelt. They knew it would be unpopular, so they went to great lengths and spent untold amounts of taxpayer dollars on lawyers to keep their mandate letters secret. This Premier knew what he was hiding. Why did the Premier keep his plans to remove lands from the Greenbelt a secret from voters? Mr. Affairs and Housing. We ran the last election on building homes for the people of the province of Ontario. Full stop. We ran the last election on ensuring that the economy was strong, that we created jobs. We've done that, Mr. Speaker. At the same time, it is absolutely true. We brought forward a policy that would have opened up lands for the Greenbelt to build houses. We acknowledge the fact, and the Premier has apologized for that, we acknowledge the fact that the people of the province of Ontario were not in support of that uh, proposal, Mr. Speaker, and that is why we return those lands to the Greenbelt. But we will not be strayed from our mission of continuing to build the economy. We will not be strayed from our mission of building 1.5 million homes. We will work with our partners. We will ensure that we build those 1.5 million homes within the urban boundaries. We'll work with our partners to do that, despite the fact that I'm already getting calls and messages from the members opposite telling me that their communities have already done their part, Mr. Speaker. I can tell Fonts. you this. All communities in the province of Ontario are going to be asked to do their part to build 1.5 million people so that we can get people out of their parents' basements and into homes. A final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I'm going to try again. Back to the Premier. Uh, it wasn't just the mandate letters they attempted to keep under wraps, Speaker. The government forced non-political public servants working on the Greenbelt project to sign non-disclosure agreements, NDAs. Ministry officials described special steps they took throughout the project, including not using email and instead using Microsoft Teams to share documents. Why did the Premier, back to the Premier, why did the Premier go to such extreme lengths to keep his change in government policy a secret? Yeah. Premier? Well, th thank you for the question. You know, I think I, I was pretty, pretty clear. I was, I was pretty, pretty clear. Sorry, it's on Viber. I don't know how to turn that off. <laughs> I don't. Anyways, I was pretty clear. I know when we went down the wrong road. I admitted the mistake. I apologize. We're moving forward. But as the minister just mentioned, that's not going to deter us, deter us from building homes. We're going to be building homes in each and every one of your ridings for your people that voted for you. We're going to build homes for newcomers that arrive here for a better life. We're going to build homes for the young people that are out of the housing market right now. And to be very frank, if we left it up to you, they wouldn't have a home right now. They wouldn't have a home under the Liberals or the NDP, because you don't believe in building. 
You don't believe in building roads. You don't believe in building hospitals or long-term care in your own ridings. You and you just you always, always go to everything. We're going to continue with our mandate that we got elected on. That's building homes, building infrastructure, creating a strong economy, straight, creating strong jobs. Thank you. I remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, uh, yesterday I asked the Premier about his private cell phone use. Uh, well, let's talk about emails. It seems that a powerful bad apple can spoil the bunch. The Auditor General found that, contrary to the freedom of information laws and cybersecurity guidelines, Conservative staff were regularly using their personal email accounts to communicate with lobbyists. It's right here. Not only that, but emails were also regularly being deleted. So back to the Premier again. Did government staff, staff in the Premier's office, or the Premier himself delete any emails or documents that are relevant to their decision to remove lands from the Greenbelt? Now, remind the members we don't use documents as props. Minister of Municipal Affairs to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I refer the, uh, the Honourable Member to page 135 of the Integrity Commissioner's uh, report. In fact, I found that the Premier's office staff were not providing such direction. The Premier's office was kept in the dark by Mr. Amato as to the process he drove for the selection of properties to, to be removed from the Greenbelt until the very near end. The, the Commissioner went on to say on page 140, I accept the purpose of the decision to remove lands from the Greenbelt was to address the housing crisis, Mr. Speaker. We have never shied away from the fact that there was a housing crisis in the province of Ontario, largely built on the backs of the Liberals and the NDP in their time in office, where they put obstacle after obstacle after obstacle in the way of people owning homes. From day one, we began to untangle the mess that was left behind by the Liberals and the NDP. Housing plan after housing plan aimed at removing Response. obstacles time and time again. They have voted against it. This isn't about anything else but the opposition's desire not to build homes for the people of the province of Ontario, we will continue. A supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Actually, let's be very clear. Page 67. Page 67 of the Auditor General's report found that this government's political staff followed the Premier's lead and also used their personal devices and email accounts to hide what they were doing. Speaker, they took a page out of the Liberals' playbook and they regularly deleted emails related to the Greenbelt. When the Liberals did that, they broke the law and someone went to jail. So back to the Premier again. Why did your staff delete emails? Once again, I'll ask the members to make their comments through the chair. Minister Mr. Clear, when the Liberals did that, that member's party stood with the Liberals and kept them in office yeah. one, two, three, four years more, Mr. Order. Speaker. It's the same pattern we see from the NDP in Ottawa, right? When there Order. was a big crisis, an SNC-Lavalin crisis, who Order. propped up the Liberals in Ottawa? It was the NDP, Mr. Speaker. When the Canadians went to, the, to, to them and said, listen, a carbon tax is killing us, who propped up the Liberals and brought a carbon Order. tax? It was the NDP. I was at Walmart, Mr. Speaker, a couple of nights ago, and I came across Carol. You know what she said? Order. She's a senior. She was a farmer. You know what she said? She couldn't believe the price of food. And she said to me, you know why? Because everything I do costs me more. From my tractor that I bring to the field, from the seeds that we put in the ground, everything costs more. And you know who's paying for it? All these people Bonds. here at Walmart who are trying to buy produce. You know why? Because they stand for higher taxes. They stand for red tape and regulation. We stand for moving economy. Order. Order. Stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. Order. 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 Start the clock. Final supplementary. You can always know when these when we're getting close to something, when they when they come back with answers like that. Let's follow along. Page six, Order. page six Order. of the Integrity Commissioner's report. Premier's Chief of Staff hand selects 
every minister's chief of staff. They gave Ryan Amato, an inexperienced, untrained staffer, one of the biggest files in government. And the integrity commissioner found that he led a, quote, chaotic and almost reckless process that led to an uninformed and opaque decision which resulted in the creation of an opportunity to further the private interests of some developers improperly. The words of the integrity commissioner, page six, to the premier. How are we Question. supposed to believe that a motto alone rigged the whole system when the premier's hands are all over this? Members will please take their seats. Mr. Mr. Spares and Housing. Again, Speaker, if the member reads past page six, she will get to other parts of the report. And in that report, it says that, again, that the integrity commissioner says that I found that the Premier's office staff we're not providing such direction, Mr. Speaker. But look, we have acknowledged, the Premier has acknowledged that we made a mistake when we brought forward a policy that the people of the province of Ontario did not support. The Integrity Commissioner himself uh, suggests, as we have said all along, that the policy was driven because we wanted to do something immediately to impact the housing crisis across the province of Ontario. We want kids to be out of their parents' basements. The other day, I talked about a young family, his first child, and instead of being able to go to a home, he's going to his bachelor apartment condo that he bought. That is, it's not who we are in the province of Ontario. We can do better, Mr. Speaker, and we will do better. But why are we there, Mr. Speaker? Because, as I said yesterday, the legions of, of doom and gloom brought this province to its knees. High interest rates are taking Response. thousands of people out of the market. We can do better. We will do better. We'll continue to remove obstacles. We'll get the job done, not only for young Canadians, but for all Ontarians who want to dream of the next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the people of Toronto were disappointed yet again after the CEO of Metrolinx, Phil Verster, announced that the Eglinton Crosstown LRT remains indefinitely delayed. When reporters demanded more information about when this project might open, information every member of the public deserves, Mr. Verster said, quote, give us some space. Mr. Verster has not only had over a year to explain the latest delay, he has received massive pay increases and enjoys the support of 59 vice presidents who all seem unable to hold the B3 contractor to account. Why does Mr. Verster still have a job? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I know how important uh, this project is uh, for the thousands of commuters who will rely on it to get to where they need to go every single day. And I know that the public wants certainty on this uh, project. That's why uh, the CEO of Metrolinx was out there yesterday and will continue to deliver those updates to the public so they can have that uh, uh, information. This is a very complex project, Mr. Speaker, but we have delivered for the people of uh, Toronto the largest and this province, the largest transit uh, expansion plan. Uh, in the history of this province and North America. In fact, Mr. Speaker, when we do things differently, uh, we are building the Ontario line with shovels already in the ground. When we look at uh, the Eglinton West Crosstown extension, we've uh, got uh, tunneling almost 50 per cent complete, so we're doing things differently. Uh, this is a bad contract that the previous uh, Liberal government left us with. We'll deliver it. We're going to make sure it's a safe Fonts. and reliable transit system, but we will take no lessons from the members opposite. How to Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, problems with the Eglinton LRT P3 contract were flagged by the Auditor General five years ago. She found that the P3 contractor was submitting deficient designs, building at risk, and failing to meet performance targets. Instead of holding the P3 contractor to account, Mr. Verster gave them a $237 million payout that the Auditor said should never have been paid. The payout didn't get this P3 project back on track, and in fact, two Order. years later, the auditor revealed that Order. the problems identified in 2018 had gotten even worse. Why does the Minister of Transportation continue to defend Mr. Verster? Members, 
stop the clock for a second. So, if the member for Ottawa South and the government house leader want to have a conversation during question period, if they could perhaps float in the hallway, that would be better. Start the clock, the Premier. Thank you for that question. You know, the Auditor General's report back then, they were talking about the the previous Liberal government, maybe maybe he might be able to come up and step up. But in, in, saying, in, saying, in saying that, anything that we inherited from the previous government, if it was not building long-term care homes, not building hospitals, not building roads, not building bridges, Order. not building transit. So this is where we're at now. Where we're at now, and it's pretty remarkable, in about four and a half years, Order. from a plan, we got funding from municipalities, Order. we got funding from the federal government, we have shovels in the ground on the Ontario line, we're halfway through Eglinton West, we're moving on the Young Extension, moving forward, and finally, Scarborough, that is being tunneled right now, has a subway. We have doubled the size of the subway line, the largest in North America in the last four and a half years. I find that absolutely remarkable, and we're going to continue building transit. Next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Parents in Ontario know that children need to be in classrooms with their teachers, learning the life and job skills they need to succeed. We know how important it is to have students in class, surrounded by peers and educators, to support their well-being, mental health and academic learning. And I know that our government has committed to making sure parents can expect their children to receive a stable, uninterrupted school year. By doing so, children can focus on what's most important, learning the foundations of reading, writing, and math. Speaker, can the minister elaborate on what steps our government has taken to ensure children receive the world-class quality education they deserve, free from interruptions? To respond, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Burlington and our entire Progressive Conservative team, because together we have delivered a deal that's going to keep kids in the classroom. Yeah. That is amazing news for the children we represent. 400,000 English public high school children have the stability they deserve. And that should be the aspiration for every child in this province. And we've been able to land a deal that has been overwhelmingly ratified by 78.4% of OSSTF members. It is now our intention, our message to the other education unions is to come to the table to sign a deal and keep children in class. There is no time for delay, and we have demonstrated that we can put kids first. We are going back to basics with additional funding and additional staffing. We are raising the standards in Ontario's publicly funded schools because we believe these kids need to achieve their full God-given potential in this province. So work with us, work together to keep these kids in class. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's reassuring for parents to remain informed about the progress our government is making to ensure that children are in their classrooms where they belong. Speaker, our government has invested in the priorities that matter most to families, initiatives and investments that will help improve reading, writing, and math skills for our students. Our government must remain steadfast in this commitment, and thanks to the leadership of the Premier and the Minister of Education, we're getting it done for our students. Because of our government's targeted investments in literacy and STEM education, we're seeing results. Speaker, can the minister please outline his plan to keep kids in class learning the skills that will set them up for long-term success? Minister of Education. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you again to the member from Burlington for her leadership in this House. Mr. Speaker, of course, stability is key. It is the cornerstone of our objective as a government to keep these kids in school as we go back to basics in Ontario schools. And because of our plan, our increase of investment, a $180 million plan to lift literacy rates, our doubling of math coaches, our modernized curriculum that connects it to the job market, the fact that we are restoring literacy and phonics and financial literacy and coding in Ontario schools for the first time in a long time. We are seeing stability according to EQAO results. Reading, writing, and math is stable or up in every single grade as assessed in this province. So yes, Mr. Speaker, our plan is working. It is incremental. It is moving in the right direction, and there's much more to do. And the way we deliver better outcomes for these children is keeping them in class. So we urge the unions 
to get to the table Pots. to sign a deal and provide stability for every single child in this province. Speaker. Next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker to the Premier. In his mandate letter, the Premier directed the former Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to develop a policy for changes to the Greenbelt, including swaps and contractions. Andrew Sidnall, the Premier's former Deputy Chief of Staff, told the Integrity Commissioner there was usually a quote back and forth between the Premier's office, the PO, and the Ministry when it came to implementing the priorities in the mandate letter. He said the PO would normally be quote, the senior partner, unquote, in this back and forth. The Integrity Commissioner was unable to find evidence of this normal back and forth with respect to the Greenbelt project, something one would expect. Did the Premier or any of his staff make a decision to suspend this normal back and forth, including the PO's senior partner role with respect to the Greenbelt project? The reply, the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think the Integrity Commissioner was pretty clear when it came to myself and my office. But what we're going to do, what we're, what we're, what we're going to do here, we're going to build homes. And the students up in those chambers, they're going to remember this day because the homes that they're going to buy in 15 or 20 years will be part of the 1.5 million homes that we're building. We're going to make sure that their families can afford a home. We're going to make sure the young people can afford a home. The newcomers that are coming to our province, 800,000 a year that we're seeing, Order. they need a place to live. And folks, let me remind you, it's this government that's building homes for those folks up there, yeah. not the Liberals, not the NDP. We're the ones building the homes and the trains and the roads that they're going to be using, and they're going to be riding on the subways that we built. Order. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Premier, I just want to note the Commissioner was very clear. There were no records. Yeah. Highly unusual. No records. Assistant Deputy Minister Sean Fraser also told the Integrity Commissioner that it was usual and expected practice for political staff within the Ministry to receive direction from the Premier's office with respect to the details of government priority. Yeah. Mr. Fraser said, quote, in my experience, political staff work with political staff. They may be ultimately responsible to the minister, but granularity like this is something that typically is dealt with at a staff level. Yeah. Mr. Fraser said such direction would come from the Premier's office. <laughs> Did the Premier or any of his staff make a decision to avoid leaving evidence of such direction with respect to the Greenbelt project? <laughs> Members, will please take their seat. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Health. In fact, uh, what the, the Integrity Commissioner said is that I found that the Premier's office uh, staff was not providing such direction, Mr. Speaker. He made it uh, very clear in the report that he was not providing such direction. Look, we made a public policy decision uh, that the people of the province of Ontario were not in support of. We made that decision because we know that we are in a housing crisis and we wanted to move fast to try to address that crisis, Mr. Mr. Speaker. We made, a, we made an incorrect decision. We are returning those lands uh, to the Greenbelt, and we will focus on building homes and communities across the province of Ontario. But you know what will be consistent, Mr. Speaker, is that member and that party will vote against every single initiative yep. to build homes. Now, the Premier just talked about it, right? They, built, they voted against subways. They voted against ho housing. They voted against long-term care. They voted against hospitals. Spons. This member here doesn't want to build anything. For the love of God, this is the one member in the NDP who's asking a question about building anything. You vote against everything. I will remind the members to make their comments to the chair. Once again, the next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the President of the Treasury Board. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the President of the Treasury Board and the Minister of Finance on the release of the public accounts this week. It's great to hear. It's absolutely great to hear that our government is implementing measures that focus on bringing fiscal stability to our province during this time of global economic uncertainty. Ongoing supply chain disruptions, inflation, and increased interest rates have created pressures for people across Ontario. Individuals and families need to see that our government is continuing to implement initiatives and investments that will make life more affordable. Speaker, can the President of the Treasury Board please explain 
explain what actions our government is taking to strengthen our province's economic resilience and ensure that Ontario is prepared for the future. The President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you so much to the member from Thornhill for that question. Ontario's economy remains resilient. But the province does face potential economic uncertainty ahead, and that's why it is so important that we make prudent and targeted investments to support the people of Ontario. As the Minister of Finance and I highlighted in the public accounts yesterday, our approach is working. We're building hospitals, schools, highways and transit. We're investing in better services across the board, and we are keeping costs down for the people of Ontario. And we are doing this in a prudent, in a responsible way that respects taxpayer dollars. In fact, we received a six straight clean audit in a row from the Auditor General, which, Mr. Speaker, is a refreshing change from the fiscal mismanagement of the previous Liberal government. Speaker, what our government will continue to do is make targeted investments that support families, businesses, and workers today while laying a strong fiscal foundation for future generations. Supplementary question. Back to you, member. Thank you, Speaker. My supplementary question is for the Minister of Finance. It's so positive and encouraging news to see once again our government received a clean audit opinion from the Auditor General, unlike under the previous Liberal government, who received qualified or reserved audit opinions on the government's consolidated financial statements. The Minister of Finance spoke about the fact that Ontario is not isolated from the conditions contributing to global economic uncertainty. That's why our government must show leadership and demonstrate a strong economic vision and a plan that will help individuals and families during this unpredictable financial period. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is continuing to work on behalf of Ontarians during these challenging economic times? Mr. Finance to respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, to the member opposite for that a very important question. And yes, Mr. Speaker, a $14 billion improvement in the deficit is meaningful to the people of Ontario on the fiscal health of this province. But let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, just yesterday, Statistics Canada outlined that Ontario's population grew by 151,000 people. That's the most since 1971. Now, let me ask you a question. When we attracted the uh, Volkswagen plant in St. Thomas, 16 million square feet and tens of thousands of jobs, did the opposition vote yes or no? No. no. Now, when we started drilling the subway in Scarborough, that's already tunneling down there, supporting 700,000 people in Scarborough, did they vote yes or no? No. no. Mr. Speaker, the Ring of Fire bringing prosperity to the north, did they vote yes or no? No. Mr. Speaker, this is a government that's going to get it done. We're going to keep going, and Response. we're going to continue voting yes. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The nurses represented by ONA from Hastings Prince Edward Public Health have been on strike for over a month. After three years on the front line of a pandemic and this government limiting their compensation to 1 per cent with Bill 124, they want respect. Public health nurses keep us safe from events like E. coli outbreaks in daycare that makes hundreds of children sick. We know the government is focused on their wealthy friends, but could the Premier please focus on these nurses and the important work that they do? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. We are absolutely focused on building our health care capacity, which is why we have programs like the Learn and Stay program, led by the Minister of Colleges and Universities. What does that actually mean? It means that individuals who want to practice and train in the province of Ontario can do that when having their tuition and uh, books covered and in exchange are able to work in, in uh, underserviced communities. We'll continue to build the health care capacity. We absolutely understand the critical value that public health units and public health nurses bring to our communities, which is why during uh, August at the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, we announced that we would be continuing to invest and support our public health units. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. While this government refuses to show any sign of respect to these striking women, my leader joined them on the picket line. 
On September 22nd, public health workers represented by CUPE also had to go on strike to get fair compensation. These public health workers keep Ontarian healthy. They make sure that our water is clean. Remember Walkerton? They make sure that the food in the restaurant we eat at is safe, and the list goes on. We know that this government likes to waste time and money in courts, but will the Premier show these nurses and public health workers the respect they deserve, fund our public health unit, and stop its appeal of Bill 124? Minister of Health. Speaker, the women and men who work in nursing professions across Ontario, whether that is in hospitals, home care, private um, facilities, and yes, absolutely in our public health units, have been critical as we protect the citizens of Ontario through the pandemic and moving out of it. And we have had an opportunity to support public health units in a very tangible way as they support our communities. We will continue to do that work, and we will ensure that as we build the health care workforce, we have opportunities across Ontario, across sectors. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Your $8.3 billion Greenbelt scandal has outraged Ontarians and shattered trust in your government. People have questions about the contents of brown envelopes, good luck massages at Vegas hotels, and the mysterious Mr. X. About how your cabinet handed over $8.3 billion in windfall profits to wealthy elites. Questions about the flawed processes that gave insiders access to conservative-connected speculators. Speaker, the best way to get honest answers for the people of Ontario and recommendations to prevent a scandal like this from ever happening again is an independent public inquiry. I want to give the Premier an opportunity today Question. to back up his Greenbelt apology and say whether he will say yes to an independent public inquiry. To respond, the Premier. Well, to my friend from the, the Green Party, not one single penny was spent of taxpayers' money. Not one cent. Not one cent. And your neighbour that's speaking beside you, let's not forget about the e-health boondoggle that cost a billion, the gas plants that cost a, 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 a billion dollars that we're, we're still paying for, not to mention the Auditor General's report, eight out of 12 you failed because she didn't believe you, and we have six out of six. But, Mr. Speaker, in Guelph, they have the slowest Order. housing that there is in the entire province. We're going to continue to build housing in Guelph, and guess what? We're going to build residence for students that their council refused to build residence for students. We're going to build Highway 7 that the Green Party will vote against us, going from Guelph to Kitchener. And mark my bottom dollar, if the leader of the Green Party goes to Kitchener River, he's going to be going on Highway 7 that he voted against. Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Supplementary question. Back to the member for Guelph. Speaker, this is exactly why we need an independent public inquiry to get the honest answers the people of Ontario deserve, because we are not getting them in this House. People in this province want to know why the government was more focused on land grabs for wealthy, well-connected insiders, $8.3 billion in windfall profits, instead of building homes that ordinary people can afford in the communities they want to live in. I've put forward two bills that would make it legal to build multiplexes, make it easier to build missing middle houses. I've put forward proposals to get speculation out of the housing market. I've put forward proposals to build deeply affordable nonprofit co-op housing in this province, but instead Question. of having a government focused on that, they're focused on benefiting wealthy, connected elites. So will the pre- 
I'm going to ask the member for Guelph to withdraw the unparliamentary comment that was included in his question. Withdraw. Apply. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I guess what the member is highlighting that he has been uns like really unspectacularly unsuccessful at building anything in his own community. Uh, you know, they, they have one of the slowest, slowest paces of home construction in his community. They can't even get they can't even get student residents built in his community. In fact, it was this government that had to step in to build long-term care homes yep. in his community, Mr. Speaker. So look, we'll take no lessons from him on how to get things done, Mr. Speaker. The Premier is right. When he goes back to his riding, he'll go back on Highway 7 that we have built. He'll visit and campaign in long-term care homes that we built. And he'll go into residences that we built. He'll go into schools that we expanded. He'll go be there. He'll do like the NDP do. You know, they'll be there to cut the ribbon and take it. But every single time in this House, they'll vote against all of it, Mr. Speaker. That is what they do. We get the job done for the people of the province of Ontario, and we'll continue to do so. The next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. The agri-food sector is a significant economic driver for our province. In Brampton, this industry contributes over $1.3 billion annually to Canada's GDP and employs over 8,500 people across 300 companies. Food producers in my community and across our province expect their government to implement solutions that are innovative and will address their needs and challenges. That said, our government must continue to do all that we can to enhance the productivity of Ontario's agri-food sector and position it for continued growth. Speaker, can the minister please share how our government is trending our agri-food industry to ensure an efficient, reliable, and responsive food supply for Ontarians. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Speaker, and I, I appreciate the question from the member for Brampton West, because did everyone hear that? There's 300 food and beverage manufacturers in the city of Brampton alone. And ladies and gentlemen, we're going to keep on growing. Our Grow Ontario strategy that we discussed at the summit has been incredibly well received across this province, and our actions are attainable because through our strategy, we're going to grow the consumption of Ontario grown and produced food by 30 percent right here at home in this province. We are going to grow the food and manufacturing opportunities and capacity by an additional 10 percent, and that's going to translate as well into an increase of an 8 percent of exports of Ontario grown and processed food over the next 10 years. Ladies and gentlemen, we're listening. Response. And those summits are important because we're introducing programs that are resonating and they're going to keep our food and beverage manufacturers strong and competitive for years to come. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. It's great to know that our government is implementing measures that are helping to position Ontario as a leader in food and beverage processing. However, in order for Ontario's agri-food businesses to further grow and develop, they must be exposed to opportunities for expansion in domestic and international markets. It is up to our government to create the right conditions so that food processors and producers are able to undertake the work of developing new products and implementing marketing strategies. Speaker, can the minister please explain what action our government is taking to help agri-food businesses to reach new markets? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Speaker, I hope everyone in this House is proud of the fact that never before has Ontario's food and beverage manufacturing sector had a, co a confidence in a government that not only understands their sector, but they have absolute confidence in the direction we're heading because of the programs. We've introduced an energy-efficient program worth $10 million. We've introduced biosecurity programs for our beverage and food sector that applicants can apply for up to $7.5 million. And we also have a $6 million program to help grow our market potential in this province of Ontario. And applicants can apply to up to $60,000 per business and up to $125,000 for programs to promote around the world that Ontario is the jurisdiction Spons. of choice when it comes to safe and uh, quality food produced right here, not only in Brampton, but around this province. We're strong and competitive worldwide. 
Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. An Ontario judge recently stayed a repeat offender's charges. J.P. Kelly was charged with 17 counts of intimate partner violence, including assault, sexual assault, choking, and threatening death. Justice Lori Thomas said this is a case that cries out to be tried on its merit. Instead, Judge Thomas was forced to stay the charges after more than two years of inexplicable delays. Let that sink in. J.P. Kelly is now back in the community without supervision or counselling. Our survivor, one survivor, told the press, I hit the floor. I was beyond disappointed in the Ontario judicial system, and I wept for the entire day. Will the Premier apologize to survivors who will never receive justice because his government has failed to fix the courts? Respond. The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and this is a very serious matter. I won't speak to, this, to the specifics as, as you have as I can't, but I can tell you that this government is taking a partner violence very seriously. We've started initiatives that have, that have never been even thought of before, Madam, Mr. Speaker. We, we've invested in our, our partner assistance uh, response program. We've invested in, in uh, human trafficking beyond that, Mr. Speaker. We've put many, many resources in. We are taking it seriously. And as for the operation of the courts, Mr. Speaker, we are working closely with our uh, justice partners, the chief justices at all levels. And today happens to be opening of the courts. And when you hear their speeches, you will hear of the collaboration, cooperation to make our system work the way that Ontarians expect, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary. Back to the member for Toronto Centre. Partner violence is an epidemic in Ontario, as it is in Canada. The court delays that survivors across Ontario are enduring are inexcusable. There was a stabbing and a shooting in Barbara Hall Park, just only a few steps away from this House Speaker, and it happened on Tuesday. The frustrated Toronto police have informed me that one of the assailants apprehended was actually out on bail. He was actually wanted for a warrant. A year ago, I asked this government to take action to keep all our communities safe. I, and since I asked this question, things have only gotten worse. Under your watch, violent, repeat offenders are being released back into the neighbourhoods because Ontario's justice system is literally collapsing on our head. Can the Attorney General explain to Ontarians why he spent his summer setting up and awarding King's Council honorific titles to PC insiders instead of fixing our collapsing courtrooms? The Attorney General. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Terrible. Terrible. The Attorney General to reply. Speaker, I would like to remind the member opposite that it was this Premier and this government that wrote the letter to the federal government that said we need bail reform. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where were you? Mr. Speaker, it was this Attorney General and this Solicitor General that went to Ottawa and achieved bail reform, Mr. Here, Speaker. Here. And it's happening now. What did the NDP do? Mr. Speaker, I will take no lessons from a member who will not even support the police in here, our here, communities. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, it's shameful. Here, here. Stop the clock. Members will please take their seats. I don't normally do this during question period, but we've got the clock stopped. In the Speaker's gallery today is a former member who served in the House from the 36th, 37th, 38th, 39th, 40th, and 41st Provincial Parliaments, representing Niagara West, Glanbrook, Erie Lincoln, and Niagara South. Welcome back to the Legislature, Tim Hudak. Okay, start the clock. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier, because when I see him answering questions in the media and here in this chamber, chamber I sense frustration because he must know conditions to build one and a half million homes don't exist in this province, and yet there are ads from this government welcoming more people. Government does not dictate the housing market. It's supply and demand that dictates the market. More people means more demand and less affordability. In the current environment, it's clear Ontario cannot support the people already here. So why subject 800,000 newcomers to a province where critical services we all rely upon are in chaos? I hear a lot of, we're going to do this, we're going to do a lot of do that, but get it done. Speaker, through you to the Premier, will he stand up for Ontario and tell Ottawa that we must take stock, get critical services back on track before welcoming more people? Well. 
you know something to the to the member from Haldeman Norfolk. We're building homes. We're getting it done. There's no bigger advocate for Ontario when talks to the federal government than this government is. Yep. And I just want to remind the member from Haldeman Norfolk that we're building not a, a few homes. We're building thousands of homes right in your your own riding. And hopefully you'll be there and you'll support us on any housing bill and you'll welcome to come and cut the ribbon and there's going to be thousands and thousands of more homes to support the workers at Stelco that live in your riding that can't afford the home to support the family members the, the support the family members that need a place to live that are going to be working at Volkswagen that will be able to live in your area as well Response. so again I, I think the uh, member means well, I truly do, and is a, is a good member, but it's better just to come on board when we're cutting the ribbon. Thank you very much, and again I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and yes, to, through you to the Premier, I do mean well, uh, and I believe that the Premier means well too, but I'm not certain that he has his facts correct on Stelco. Anyway, the average cost of a home in Norfolk County last year in 2022 was $830,000. I spoke to a family. I spoke to a family last night who is packing their bags because they see no hope in this province. And I'm not buying what this government is selling on the labor front because there are signs. Even potential newcomers have discovered that we are not the land of opportunity as permanent resident applications have plummeted. As I traveled my riding this summer, all I heard from constituents is that life has become unaffordable and they don't care whose fault it is. The member from Thorn Hill mentioned this this morning. Speaker, through you to the Premier, what is this government's plan for making life more affordable for the families of Ontario working so hard to make ends meet and yet falling further and further behind? The Premier. I, I, I agree. Government doesn't create homes, but we create the conditions in the environment for companies to come there and build homes and build businesses. What are we doing to make things more affordable? And I can't remember if you voted or not. If you voted for the license plate stickers that saved eight million people got a check right at their front door Order. from our from our Order. government. We cut the tolls on the 412 and 418. We reduced Order. the gas prices by 10.7 cents. And I do agree with the member. Who holds the federal government accountable on the carbon tax? We do. We mention it nonstop. The extra 15 cents they're paying at the gas pumps, delivering every product we have in the province, is being affected by the worst tax this country has ever seen. And it's a useless tax, Response. and that's the carbon tax. Again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the new Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Our government must be committed to building a stronger and prosperous Ontario. This commitment must include ensuring that Ontario is a leader in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and supporting our province's biodiversity. Under the previous Liberal government, Ontario missed out on key opportunities to be part of the electric vehicle revolution, could have helped in advancing transportation technology and supporting the environment. Ontario is home to a significant source of critical minerals that are essential for our province's future. That is why our government must continue to take thoughtful and meaningful actions to ensure that these minerals are extracted in a responsible and environmentally safe manner. Speaker, Question. there are some people who believe that there is a trade-off between growing the economy and protecting the environment. They believe that the focus on one requires sacrificing the other. Does the Minister of the Environment share that zero-sum perspective? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. I want to thank the member from uh, Thornhill for that uh, great question. I also want to thank the, the community in Barry Innisfil for putting their trust in me to be elected in this legislature and for the Premier's confidence uh, in putting me in the role of being the Environment, Conservation and Parks Minister. But, Speaker, our government has proven that we can both have a clean environment and a strong economy. 
Under our plan, we are already taking historic action to cut pollution and also create new jobs. We are well underway in creating a made in Ontario supply chain for electric vehicle manufacturing. We negotiated a deal to protect thousands of jobs at DeFasco while making a once in a generation green steel deal. We are also unlocking critical minerals in the province and helping spur new investments in battery technology. Under our plan, we are securing good, high paying jobs for Ontario workers while also reducing greenhouse Response. gas emissions. It's about choosing it's not about choosing the environment or the economy, Speaker. We're choosing both. Here, here, here. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and congratulations on your new role. Uh, sorry, the minister's new role. This response uh, will be welcomed by my constituents, who strongly support the importance of collaboration when it comes to planning for the future. Unfortunately, opposing voices repeat the tired argument that development opportunities and protection of our natural resources cannot be reconciled. This stubborn and rigid opinion do little to help local communities, businesses, and our province as a whole. As our government continues to build partnerships with communities throughout Ontario and with leading industry leaders, there is tremendous potential and many reasons for optimism. Speaker, before our government came to office, businesses were fleeing Ontario Question. due to high energy costs and high taxes. How is our government securing Ontario's prosperity? Mr. The Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker, speaker, picture a family, a house in the suburbs, a car in the driveway, a mom and dad with good jobs, and kids who are safe when they walk or bike to hang out with their friends. So much about this picture, the car, the suburbs, and the safe streets terrify the opposition. The opposition centers their policies around making this dream unaffordable and impossible to achieve. Under this government, under the leadership of Premier Ford, soon that family Order. will be driving a made in Ontario electric vehicle or will be stepping into a new Ontario Line subway station. Maybe their destination will be one of the new provincial parks we've created or one of the new schools we've built or one of the new jobs we've helped unlock. Speaker, under the leadership of Premier Ford and this government, we are making record investments to secure the future of Ontario. Response. We won't let the opposition take that bright future. Here, 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 here. Order. Thank you. The next question, the member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The government is quick to pick up the phone when it comes to helping their friends. So will they encourage the management of the Electrical Safety Authority to prioritize the safety of Ontarians and respectfully bargain a fair and equitable deal with their professional safety employees? To reply. <laughs> I recognize the minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. As the new minister responsible for this as one of 12 administrative authorities under the jurisdiction of my ministry. Ontarians' well-being is a top priority for our government, and my ministry and I hold our oversight over the ESA very, very seriously. That is why we continue to ensure and enhance public electrical safety in the province of Ontario through the ESA. Now, the ESA has advised that as of the morning of September 20, 2023, the Society of United Professionals has commenced strike action. The union represents about 12 per cent of the ESA's workforce, primarily in the engineering, IT, communications and licensing departments. The remainder of the ESA's employees continue to work, including inspectors Response. and customer service call centre representatives. Any questions regarding the collective bargaining process should be directed to the ESA, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, 6,000 actual commercial workers have been locked out since April of last year. Before locking them out and hiring scab workers to do their jobs, the ad agencies demanded huge cuts to their wages and the elimination of their benefits and pensions. At the one-year mark, I asked the Premier to stop using advertising agencies who use scab workers. Five months have passed, Speaker, and the Conservative government continues to buy ads from wealthy union-busting agencies like FCB, Wink, and Lou Burnett. In fact, they 
MOT is about to record another non-actor commercial. Actor Toronto has contacted the ministry several times about this. Crickets. Will the Premier halt this Ministry of Transportation commercial, and will he commit to stop using advertising agencies to use replacement scab workers in Ontario's government-funded ads? Sure. Uh, I thank the honourable member for the uh, for the question. Of course, we will continue to follow all of the rules that uh, uh, that uh, we must, ensuring that we, when we do our advertising or any other government uh, uh, procurement, that it follows all the rules as established uh, uh, through legislation, Mr. Speaker. But at the same time, of course, we're going to continue to uh, ensure that we advertise and we get the message out to the people of the province of Ontario. Uh, much of the advertising uh, that we do helps inform people, whether it's uh, on some of the very important initiatives uh, through health, uh, through health care, uh, some of the other safety initiatives that come across through uh, various uh, ministries, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, so, no, we're not going to stop doing advertising because it is a very important part of helping ensure that the people of the province of Ontario are aware of important initiatives uh, that are important to them and their families, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Ontario's diversity is one of the greatest strengths, with people from all backgrounds, faiths and walks of life representing our province. The people of this province represent the best in abilities, perspectives and experiences that should be respected, valued and appreciated. Unfortunately, discrimination and barriers to inclusion and acceptance still occur in our province. Any experience with discrimination, harassment or stigma negatively impacts a person's self-identity and well-being. Our government must continue to invest in strategies that promote diversity, equity and social Action. inclusion. Speaker. Can the minister please explain how our government is building safer, stronger, and more inclusive communities in, for Ontarians? For citizenship and multiculturalism. Well, uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Richmond Hill for that question. Uh, there's no question Ontario is a global leader in celebrating diversity and is home to people from all backgrounds, faiths, and cultures. Our diversity and inclusivity is essential to who we are and remains a source of great strength for the province of Ontario. Nonetheless, as the member mentioned, there's always more that we can do to strive to build a stronger and more welcoming community and province. Just last month, Mr. Speaker, I was proud to release the Building a Stronger, More Inclusive Ontario, Ontario's Anti-Racism Strategic Plan. Speaker, we are taking an all-the-government approach to dismantle barriers to success and empower communities. The revised strategic plan outlines over $130 million from my ministry alone with additional support Response. from ministry partners. The strategy highlights the meaningful work that is already underway to drive positive change while laying a foundation for future action. Good job. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Safety and social inclusion are central to creating cohesive society and a strong economy that will secure Ontario's future growth and prosperity. Especially in my riding in Richmond Hill, we have a lot of different diversity living in that community. Acts of discrimination, hatred and violence have no place in our communities. That is why our government must continue to take action to implement measures that will combat hate and will protect the people of our province. Investments and approaches by our government must be innovative and meaningful within our local communities. Thank you to our minister. Speaker, may I ask the minister to please elaborate on the steps our government is taking to ensure that Ontario is a safe, inclusive Question. and accepting place for all? Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism. Well, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and the member is completely right. 
Ontario's anti-racism strategy contains over 40 unique initiatives across 14 partner ministries and millions in investments by our government to remove barriers and build a more inclusive Ontario, Mr. Speaker. This includes the Minister of Education, who implemented de-streaming of grade 9 students, ensuring that all students can be successful in and pursue any post-secondary pathways they so choose. To the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, who has made critical investments to support economic development priorities in Indigenous communities and provide increased access to capital for Indigenous businesses and entrepreneurs. To the Minister of Health, who's expanded the high priority community strategy to remove barriers to improve access to health care for Indigenous, Response. racialized, and low income Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, these are just some of the initiatives outlined in Ontario's anti racism strategic plan that are already driving real change in community. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the Premier has used immigrants as an excuse to justify his green belt grab. Despite the government's own housing task force saying that they do not need to build on protected farmland. In fact, Environmental Defense reported that there is enough available land to build three cities the size of Paris, France, without touching the green belt. Now, if the government really wanted to build affordable homes, Speaker, why haven't they started building on the 59,000 hectares already available right now? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Mr. Speaker, because we have been spending the last five years untangling the mess of obstacles and intrusions that were put in place by the Liberals and NDP, Mr. Speaker. But I give the member my word and every member of that caucus over there that, yes, indeed, we will be moving very aggressively in each and every riding of this province to build new homes for the people of the province of Ontario. You know, I referenced it in one of my own first news conference. I have a very close affection to the member opposite because my parents' journey to home ownership started in her riding on Dentonia Park when the entire Calandra clan in one home, in basements, all in that one place. And then from there, they moved to 6 Lombardi Crescent, a wartime home in the members' riding. My dad was a hairdresser on Birchmount Avenue in the members' riding. Then they got another home, Mr. Speaker. That's where their journey ended. You know why they came to Canada? Because we offered them the pathway to that Spons? dream, Mr. Speaker. I won't take that away for the next generation of the people of the province of Ontario, and I hope she'll join with me to make sure that we deliver that dream for them. That concludes our question period for this morning.